Well, stay standing and let's pray together. God, we get the privilege here in America of coming to worship you. Lord, we get the awesome privilege of coming to a school that we're able to rent out to be able to sing songs of praise to you, to gather as a community, to fellowship with one another, to share our burdens with each other, to share our joys with each other, to learn about you, to see our children raised up in the Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, God. We don't take that for granted, and we don't take it lightly. We're here today to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
And so I just invite you to really, truly pay attention to the words in this song. Just let it be your prayer this morning. If you're going through something hard, if you're going through something difficult, hold on to the hope that these, these words bring in this song.
one day Jesus is going to return and there's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more hurting. We're going to find complete comfort in you. But until that day, Lord, we hold on to the hope that Jesus Christ gives us.
thank you so much for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word taught. And so as Jared comes up this morning, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts through the power of your word, Lord, that we would leave here changed and impacted by the truth your word has for us this morning. I pray that anybody who didn't intend on being here, maybe they were invited here by a friend, that they would encounter you today, the power that you bring, Lord, the peace that you bring. Um, I pray that they would find the hope of Jesus here today, Lord, and those who do know you. I believe they'd be encouraged in their faith. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, please be seated wherever you are this morning. You know, Jared, uh, we've got a lot in common. His name's Jared. It's Jared, Jared showed this morning. His middle name is Michael. My middle name is Michael. So uh, Jared, Michael, and I have been friends for a long time. It's been really fun uh, having him a part of our church. And I was a little bit older than he was, and so we did a little bit of kind of discipleship stuff, D now things, and he was a part of our student ministry that I was involved in at Hoffman Town Church. And so let's thank Jared and his family for the sacrifice this morning. Uh, for being here with the band, Manny. Yeah, I'm just going to say it, Mariana. They, they don't call it man E for nothing. He's no. the man. Him and Mariana, they rocked it. They were able to adjust on the fly this morning. They practiced songs all week long, and then they had three brand new ones. Probably three new songs for you guys, too. So thanks for joining and worshiping us. But, you know, that's the beauty of... Christianity is it's the body of Christ. Many parts. We all have different gifts and talents and abilities, but we all work together for the kingdom of God and the glory of God. And so every part is necessary. If you came in here this morning, you just don't feel like you've measured up. You don't feel as if you're good enough, that you don't contribute enough. Well, I will tell you, you're wrong. You're needed. You've got gifts. You've got talents that God has placed in in you that he wants to use for his glory. And all the gifts and talents don't look like the guy the talking head or the guy playing worship. Many different gifts and talents. And so thank you guys for being here and being a part of this body here at Anchor Church. Now, when you're part of a body, Mike and I were talking this morning that if one part of your body hurts, the whole body really hurts. He told me about how he cut his foot out on the lake, right? And how painful that was and how much you don't realize how much your foot is uh, just this vital organ in your life or part of your life and how it's so important and how everything else is affected and so uh, some of our body has been affected here at our church uh, we've got a good friend his name's Dave Baca and his brother is Daniel Baca maybe you saw him on the news uh, it was his vehicle that was turned over off of I-40 in Carlisle uh, so Dave who comes to our church who we met at Starbucks and invited. Uh, his brother is the one who passed away on Thursday. And so, Body, um, if you know Dave, you know I'd love for you to you know give him a little love this week. Send him a text or a Facebook, or maybe come to Starbucks on any day in the morning at about eight o'clock. He's always there. Uh, but if you don't know Dave, that's okay. We're we're still family here, and you can pray for him and his family as they go through that tragedy. Because Daniel left behind a wife and a daughter. I believe eight years old, Mike. Is that what you said around there? She's nine. Uh, nine years old. Um, so let, let's pray because they're, 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 they're friends as well right there. So let's pray for the family and those affected by it. I'm going to give you a chance to just voice your prayer to God, and then we'll pray together, okay? God, when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. And so our hearts Go out to the Baca family. Lord, a, a large family that's got a great history here in Albuquerque. Lord, it's a sad loss to lose Daniel. But from what I've been told from the family, Daniel was a follower of Jesus. He believed in you and he asked you to forgive him of his sins. And his eternity was secured and purchased by the blood of your son Jesus on the cross. And Lord, we thank you that you rose again, that you conquered death and life, so that when we face death, we don't have to worry and we don't have to fear that we can have eternal life. Lord, that we can be with you. And we thank you that your word says through the Apostle Paul that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And while Daniel's family longs for him and misses him, Lord, he is in heaven now, basking in your glory enjoying the fruits of heaven, awaiting the arrival of his friends and family one day. And so we lift up those who are left behind here 
Lord, your Holy Spirit, a name for your Holy Spirit is Comforter. So be their Comforter now. Be the Jehovah Jireh, their provider, Lord. Protect them, guard their hearts and their minds and allow this time of pain and difficulty they're going through to be a time of healing and mourning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You know, being a part of a church is not just participatory in the sense of you sit back and listen. You played an active role just now in praying for him and his family and those affected. And affected. And so I thank you for that. And Today we're going to be jumping into our, our series that we've been going through called Anger Management. In the last few weeks we've looked at anger from all different kinds of angles. We've looked at anger from the righteous anger, that it's okay to be angry, that it's okay to be angry when you stand up for what is right. And we saw that with Jesus overturning the money changers in the temple. And we saw last week how to work through your anger, really how to avoid Anger. How, how to avoid crossing over from that righteous anger to that infuriating, sinful anger that can consume you and lead to bitterness and rage by fixing our eyes on Jesus. We think about the good things. Last week we looked at Philippians 4, 8. I gave you a challenge, pop quiz after church. And I'm going to test each and every one of you, see if you memorize the verse. You did your homework or not this week. I'm just kidding, okay? You don't have to get open your Bible and start memorizing <laughs> Philippians 4, 8. I encourage you to continue memorizing it if you haven't memorized it yet. Because it's a powerful verse that will transform your thoughts. You know, when you're feeling negative and you're overwhelmed and you've got anger consuming you. You've got to replace that with Christ-like thoughts. You fix your eyes on Jesus. You think about the things of Jesus. And then you look at the attributes of those around you. Instead of thinking about the negative things they always do, look into their life and see what is God producing in them and through them that is positive. You focus on that, and that shifts gears. But there's some moments where you've just got to work through. Maybe you've got a family, and there's family problems, and you just can't get any headway there, and you struggle with the relationships, and the, the anger and bitterness has pushed you so far apart. Maybe you can relate to this family at Christmas time. Check out this video. I just never thought it could happen to me. To my own family. It just felt like we were trapped in this black hole of anger and resentment. Like the walls were just closing in on me. Like I was in the trash compactor from Star Wars, and I'm Luke Skywalker, and there's Princess Leia, who I don't know is my sister yet. And even though Han Solo is trying his hardest to save us, he's driving me crazy. And then there's Chewie in the corner just going, rrr, rrr. <laughs> Anyway, then the holidays roll around, and it's just like Christmas to bring out the worst in all of us. All those long-standing grudges, unresolved family conflict just seem to rear their ugly heads this time of year. The last thing I wanted to do was go to the annual family holiday party. Then my doctor told me about reconciling sex. Reconcilesac is recommended for all occasions where friends and family need a little help and bitter grudges. Reconcilesac is not for people who are dating or engaged or may become engaged during the holidays. Reconcilesac should never be taken with in-laws, in lactists, and the should never prove over those taking a placebo. Relational conflicts involving money or inheritance also show no improvement. Take Reconcilesac at least 30 minutes before any anticipated conflict. Sharing reconcilesac with others may increase your chances of reconciliation. So if you're looking for immediate reconciliation with the ones you're supposed to love, look no further. Ask your doctor if reconcilesac is right for you. Thank you, reconcilesac. Ask your doctor about reconcilesac. Side effects may include excessive hugging, chronic hand hold, inexplicable affection for your loss, and sloppy kisses from aunts and grandmas. They say recommended dosage may result in marriage proposal or pregnancy. If you My favorite is the side effects of that. You know. That's great, right? So we have uh, reconcile sex pills for you guys as you leave. Thank you for coming. Have a great morning. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if it was just that easy? 
take a pill, and all of your problems go away. You guys ever got a Chuck E. Cheese? You mean Satan's house? <laughs> right? Chuck E. Cheese, the pizza's terrible. It's unlimited sugary Cokes for the kids. There's giant moving mouses that talk and scare you and put nightmares in your dreams. Man, Chuck E. Cheese is rough. Now, I go to birthdays all the time. It's like what I do for a living on the weekends. You thought I was a pastor, but I just attend birthdays of my children's friends. They put all the kids in the same class in the fall. The fall age five-year-olds. What does that do to parents? That means three birthday parties every weekend for the entire fall semester. So Chuck E. Cheese and I, it's like my country club for the children. That's where we go. And there's one game there. Whack-a-mole. You guys ever play whack-a-mole? Isn't that great? Whack-a-mole's awesome. You get the whack-a-mole out, and you just start smacking. You try to whack that mole. You get one, and then you're getting distracted, and one pops up. Just when you think you've got it down, three or four pop up at the same time, right? And you can't ever beat it. Oh, I wish I could beat that game. And I can only get a score on it. I can't destroy it. I can't beat the game. I can't whack all the moles because it's just too consuming. Just when you think you've got one of those moles whacked, there's another one. that pop right up. Our lives are a whack-a-mole. They really are. When you think about the relational conflict we have in our lives, it's like the whack-a-mole. Just when you think you got one issue resolved with that old friend from high school who's trolling you on Facebook, and I finally got that resolved, I deleted my account, and I said, don't bother me anymore, boom, there's something going on at work. You've got a superior who's breathing down your neck. You've got a co-worker talking behind your back. And then, oh, you've got family problems. One family wants to meet for Thanksgiving at this time. Another part of the family wants to meet at the exact same time. And they don't want to get together at the same time together, make it easy on you. One after another. Relational conflict. You think, gosh, how am I ever going to win the game whack-a-mole of life? Well, if you approach it the way you approach the game, whack a ball. You won't win. You won't. You cannot win. It's set up for failure. You really can't. Because we approach it with this concept. I've got my hammer, and there's the problem, and I'm going to take care of the problem. And a lot of times in our spiritual life, we try and surrender over one aspect of our life. We try and surrender over the relational conflict or the, our sex lives or uh, our <laughs> anger issues or whatever we're going through. We say, Lord, I give you this. And we're approaching it the same way, trying to tackle each mobile popping up. But God's not interested in that. What he's interested in is total surrender. I just, here I surrender one part of my life to you. I'm here on Sunday. This is church. I'll be here for that. No, he wants your entire life. And when you give total surrender over to God, he just unplugs the whack-a-mole game for you. He takes the power out, and he takes over the situation, and he infuses you with his ability, his love, and his strength to be able to overcome any obstacle you've got in your life. And relational conflict will always pop up. Many of you probably have someone in your life that when you see in the office, you avoid. You see them and they're like, oh no, they're going to talk to me, they're going to bother me, so I'm going to walk the other way. Maybe they're your neighbors. They go out to get the mail and you're going out to get the mail. You just turn you 180. You go back, oh, forgot something. I'm not going to go get in front of my neighbor again. He's going to talk my ear off, and I don't want to talk to that And God supplies us the tools when we surrender our life to him completely to be able to tackle relational conflict. Today's message is titled, How to Resolve Your Anger. Because most of us have these anger issues that rise up that someone has done to us. The anger is being developed within us because someone has done something to us. And we can get along for a short time avoiding that person or avoiding that conflict in our marriage or relationships that we're in. We can get along in the office 
for a short period of time. So you know what? It's, it's not worth the hassle. But over time, it builds and builds and builds. And eventually, it'll explode. And so Jesus, a man who faced many conflicts, bringing a revolution forward, starting Christianity, transitioning Judaism into Christian faith, being the Messiah. He faced opposition and obstacles from every corner. And he had some very wise words. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to look at Luke chapter 17. And this is like the compact version of where we're going on a bigger scale. We're going to look around in Scripture today, and we're going to scan through several different passages of Scripture, because the Bible is your best commentary. Do you guys know what a commentary is? Someone reads the Bible, they study it, they observe the text, they interpret the text, and they apply it, and then they write it all out. There's some really great commentators out there. Martin Luther was a great commentator. Matthew Henry, Ward Wearsby. And, and they wrote these books that many people will study and they, they, they want to get their perspective on what is that verse saying? Well, today we're going to use the Bible as our commentator. We're going to use the Bible to help show us and support this passage of Scripture and the necessity of it in our lives. Because what better commentary to get than from the author, the Holy Spirit, the one who inspired the word to be written. So in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, it says this. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Pence, forgive him. And if he sins, against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Well, that's kind of hard. That's a difficult truth. Forgiveness to someone who keeps making you mad over and over and over. It's a smaller passage of what Jesus is trying to unleash here. Now flip over to Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. Matthew 18 says, hey, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a Brother, I love this passage that we're getting into today. I'm a weird one. It's a crazy one. I'm one of those people in life that likes conflict. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I don't like <laughs> conflict. But I like working through conflict. Working through conflict is so fun for me. And, and I think it's just I'm a little sadistic. I need some therapy or something, because I, I, I don't understand myself, but I don't mind conflict. If we were to do a little quiz, and you were to raise your hands, you don't have to raise your hands, okay? But I'm willing to bet that most of us in this room want to avoid conflict at all costs. At all costs, avoid conflict. And Matthew starts out, and the scriptures say, if your brother sins against you. You're like, sweet, I'm off the hook. I don't even have a brother. <laughs> I got all sisters. I don't have a brother. This doesn't apply to me. Well, this is the scripture's way of saying you're the body of Christ, you're the family of God. You're brothers and sisters in Christ. You're connected in community. We're a part of a larger community called the family of God. We're Anchor Church. And this week, we were able to go to the Evangelism Conference and hear some incredible teaching, awesome worship all week long at Hoffman Town Church. And we were part of a larger network there of another family of churches in the Southern Baptist Convention working together to advance the kingdom of God. We're, we're, we're no lone rangers here. Not even as a church. We're not off on our own. We have churches that help support us financially. They pray for us got a great support system. 
It's because we're part of the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you feel alone, if you feel isolated, if you feel as if you're an outcast, well, guess what? You might be the redheaded stepchild of the family of God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have a family. You have brothers and sisters. You have people who care about you and want to get to know you. We've all got to take those steps towards that. It says if your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. I love the process because we would much rather talk about someone and about what they did to us than to someone that did that to us. It's easier. It's, easier. it's, it's a little more fun, isn't it? You know, there's no consequences. Uh, on the onset, you think, gosh, there's no consequences. They're not mad at me. You know, they're not awkward. And they don't feel like, you know, like I'm mad at them. So I can just go vent to someone else and talk about them behind their back. And the other person who's listening, they're thinking, you know, I don't know if I want to say anything, but I'm not going to say anything to you because I don't want conflict. You're talking about somebody else, but I don't want to talk to you about talking about somebody else. So I'll just listen and smile and and then we're on the receiving end. We're like, wow, they really get me. They understand my problems. They listen to me. But no, they don't get you at all. They just don't want to talk to you about how rude you're being. You're talking about someone behind their back. Because most of us would rather talk about someone than to someone for the very thing that they did us. And Scripture calls us out. It says, if your brother sins against you, makes you mad, you go to him and tell him his fault. No, it doesn't say get on Facebook or Twitter and announce to the world and direct message him and put his Twitter handle in there. Hey, you hurt me. You did something mean. No, it says you go to them alone. Now, if you've ever been approached by someone, <laughs> but anyone, and I said, you know what? You did something that I didn't agree with or it hurt me. I just don't understand. Help me understand that. Listen loud, okay? Right now. That person loves you. That person cares about you and the relationship enough to come to you and say, hey, what's going on is going to break us down the road. It's going to ruin us down the road because anger and bitterness are going to sit in. It's never going to be resolved. So if I don't take care of this now, we're done. So let's work together, because I care about you, I love you, and I love this relationship. And so scripture tells us to go to him. And if you go to him and he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Leviticus 19, 17 says, this will be up on the screen. It says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. I mean, isn't that the wild part? Like someone hurts you and you end up being the sinner. Scripture says, go to that person. Work it out. Continues on in verse 16. It says, okay, we all know what's going on here. We all know that most people don't respond well to conflict. Do you get defensive when somebody attacks you? I know I do. Verse 16 says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So in this community, you know, we're in that honeymoon phase. We're, we're just kind of still there. We're a two-year-old church, just over two years old. But for some of us, we're starting to see some of the warts. You know, we're, we're starting to see some of the things that were hidden when we were just dating. Now we know each other, right? And so sometimes problems arise and conflict has to take place and reconciliation to restore the relationship needs to happen because if it doesn't, it's going to be messy. And so you go to that friend. You say, listen, what you did hurt me. Or what you're doing is sinful. It's wrong. It's affecting the body of Christ. You need to change. And they don't listen. They don't respond. The Bible says come with a couple witnesses, one or two witnesses. Find trusted friends, people that know the situation, that you trust, and are walking with God. 
And this isn't to rally a group of picketers to yell at you for making someone mad or sinning. This is all done in love. It says, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be as to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. It says, your perception needs to change. If you go to someone and there is sin taking place, and you approach them on that sin, and you bring a witness, and they refuse, and you bring friends, and you pray through this, and there's no change, you change as a church how you approach that person. You treat them as the scripture says, a tax collector or a Gentile. This says it's someone who's outside of the family of God. So you're praying for them. You're praying for repentance. You're loving on them. You're sharing God's love with them, but you don't treat them as if one of the fold. Titus 3.10, it says this, okay, because this takes place. It takes place a lot. It says, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. You know, you can't change people, is what the scripture is saying. Only the Holy Spirit can change someone. And so, when you go to someone, you say, hey, I come to you. You're my brother, my sister in Christ. I love you. I care about you. I care about this relationship and what's going on, what's taking place. It's not good. It's sinful. It's hurting the body of Christ. You bring friends and there's no change. You warn them. And you move on. Because the rest is wasted energy. But sure, you absolutely still love them. You still pray for them. But they are not your project. They're not your project to change. There are bigger and better things that God has in store for you. Verse 18 says, Truly I say to you, whenever, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. A king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. If this is in weight, in gold, a talent, the actual measurement, this could be over a million dollars in that day. If I'm a king and I've got a million dollars out, I'd like that million dollars back. You with me? Well, and since he could not pay his master, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. And this time the custom was if you couldn't make good on your debt, you were thrown in jail and your family had to work on your behalf, your extended family, to get you out of jail. Well, verse 26 says, the servant fell on his knees, begging him, imploring, the ESV uses. Have, a patient, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. hundred denarii, some simple wages compared to the million that he owed the king. Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down and pleaded with him and said, have patience with me and I'll pay you. But he refused and he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you make a servant, I forgave you and all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? 
And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So this storyline that Jesus is telling is really the story of our lives. The story of our lives. Someone harms us and hurts us and does something to us. And what do we want? We want justice. They should pay. But when we hurt those around us, what do we want? We want mercy. We want forgiveness. Grace is this amazing gift God gives to his believers. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't buy it. It's a gift from God. It's good news. He gives us his grace, forgiveness. He forgives us of our sins. And he gives us this wonderful gift of eternity in heaven. Mercy, the way I like to look at mercy, is mercy is you don't get what you deserve. Grace is you get what you don't deserve. But mercy is you do not get what you deserve. That's, that's our good God. He goes, hey, you don't, you don't deserve this. But I'm going to give this to you anyway. Here's grace. Here's forgiveness. Hey, and the way you're acting right now, you really deserve these kinds of consequences. But I'm going to show you my mercy. And so what are we to do? Verse 35 says, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Resolving your anger begins and finishes with forgiveness. It begins with forgiveness when you realize that you've done a lot of wrong to a lot of people around you, and in particular to a holy God. And He has forgiven you. And it finishes when you're able to express and show God's forgiveness to the ones who harm you. A story about two farmers. They were brothers. Their daddy passed down an inheritance to them. And their farms were side by side. There's a creek and a meadow that went between these two farmers. But as brothers do, they got into a fight. Instead of resolving conflict, bitterness set in. So where these two brothers began to hate each other. They would have nothing to do with one another. Finally, one brother, fed up, took a bulldozer to the meadow and opened up the creek so that there was a giant rushing river to come through their property to divide the two of them. Carpenter came through and went to the other brother and said, is there any work I can do on your farm, sir? And the other brother looked across at his farming brother who caused the creek to explode and create a great divide between him and his brother. He decided that, hey, despite that mean brother, I'm going to put up a fence said, sir, the wood is over there. You get the wood, and you build up an eight-foot fence. Make it pretty on my side, ugly on his. And every day when he sees that fence, he'll remember all the bad things he's done to me. And the carpenter said, I've got you covered. I know exactly what to do. The wood's over there? Thank you. And he went, and he picked up the wood, he started working he went back to the farmer and he said, my work is done. I'd love for you to see my project. The farmer who asked the carpenter to do the work walked with the carpenter out to the creek. But instead of seeing a fence, there was a wooden bridge. And in the distance, he saw his brother running to him. And as he prepared for a fight, he looked at the carpenter and said, what did you do? I asked for a fence, not a bridge. When the brothers met at the middle of the bridge, the brother who blew the creek said to his brother who wanted to build a fence, after all the mean things I've done to you, you still love me. You built a bridge 
to connect us again. And the man looked at the carpenter, and the carpenter said, my work here is done. I'm here to build bridges, not fences. That's a little story about farmers and fences and creeks and bridges. But there is a carpenter named Jesus who came to build bridges and not fences. If we know that God, and we know him to be true, Folks, there's zero reason why we should have fences in our lives with anyone. We see several cases here. When someone has hurt us, the Bible tells us, we've got to go to them. We've got to be the ones who are mature. Even when we're the ones hurt, someone's sinning against us. We approach them, and we love them. And we see, when we want justice around us, then we're being reminded that it's God who showed us mercy. 